Hello, everyone. Welcome to When the Science Says Children, But the Law Says Adults, Trying and Sentencing Youth as Adults. I'm Carmel Schachar, the Executive Director of the Petrie Farm Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. I feel very honored, frankly, to be able to facilitate such an important conversation. I think the approach that the law takes to categorizing whether a particular individual should be tried as an adult or be treated as a child is a really interesting question in which the neuroscience can really inform the law and update and modernize its approach. Before we dive into the substance, a few housekeeping remarks. First of all, we are reserving time for a moderated conversation and we very much hope that you submit your questions. You can submit them at any time. You don't have to wait until the moderated portion by using the Zoom Q&A feature, which is found in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. We also hope that you'll join the conversation or even submit questions on Twitter. We're at Petrie Farm. If you have any technical issues today, please email us at petrie-flom at law.harvard.edu and we'll do our best to help you. We will be sharing the fully captioned event video with all registrants, so yourself, other people who've registered who maybe couldn't make it within one to two weeks. Please feel free to share that link widely with friends, family, colleagues who you think might be interested in this topic. Speaking of interests, if you are interested in Petrie Plum Center upcoming events, news, or education programs, please sign up for our newsletter. It comes out only twice a month, so it will not clog your air inbox. Or consider reading Bill of Health, which is our blog that brings really interesting explorations of cutting edge health policy, health law, bioethics issues to a general audience. We're running an amazing symposium looking at disability and climate change, for example. Or check out our upcoming events. I know we have a great event on marijuana and cannabis policy coming up, not coincidentally, for April 20th, as well as our annual conference, which will be looking at health law as private law. Now, I would be amiss to hog all of the credit and glory because this event has really been the product of some very hard work with our wonderful collaborators at the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior at Massachusetts General Hospital. They are collaborators on our project on law and applied neuroscience. If you are interested in what they do, I strongly encourage you to check out their website at clbb.org or find them on Twitter at mghclbb, as well as on Facebook, again, at mghclbb. The work they do is some of the most cutting edge in this area. With that being said, I want to get to the substance as quickly as possible. And so I would like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Dr. Stephanie Tabashnik, who is a psychologist and attorney, as well as a critical part of the project on law and applied neuroscience, as she is the senior fellow in law and applied neuroscience, both at the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior and here at the Petrie Flom Center. Okay, thank you, Carmel, for that introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Today, we are first going to hear from adolescent brain expert BJ Casey, and then juvenile law expert Marsha Levick. Following the two presentations, we will then have a robust discussion that I will moderate on the sentencing of youth in adult court. I will now turn to introductions for this star-studded event. Um, Marsha Levick is the co-founder and chief legal officer at the Juvenile Law Center. She has played a role in many juvenile sentencing cases, including a number of cases before the United States, before the United States Supreme Court. BJ Casey is an expert on the adolescent brain. She is a professor at Columbia University and a member of the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School. She is widely published, and her research is often cited in amicus briefs, including um, involving the sentencing of youth offenders. And now I will turn it over to neuroscience extraordinaire, uh, BJ Casey. Thank you. And then BJ, if you can just share your screen or uh, Marsha. 
Here, I will um, share the screen. Sorry, I was muted. That's okay. Can you see the screen now? Um, no. Oh, shoot. That's okay. This is one of the things that often happens uh, since we're no longer in person. Everyone always has their presentations handy when you're in person, but when you're doing virtual, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, BJ, do you want me to pull it up? And there we go. Okay, now we can see it. Now, Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate being a part of this discussion today. It's such an important topic. Um, and just thrilled uh, to be presenting with my esteemed colleague uh, and legal scholar, Marsha Lubbock. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on the developmental science and I'll um, primarily be focusing on data from the ages of 10 to 25 years. Uh, this is in part because uh, these ages represent an emerging definition of adolescence with 10 being around the onset of puberty uh, but then with continued significant changes occurring throughout this period into the early to mid 20s. Now, I'll be providing evidence today that suggests that assigning adult status to children is not based on biology or psychology. And I also just wanna note that there are expert and health organizations like the World Health Organization, NIH, United Nations, who all acknowledge that there's continued maturity and development that extends into the 20s. And even our laws in this country recognize extended maturation into the early 20s with the extended age for drinking, um, for parent insurance coverage and foster care. These laws recognize that special protections should be given to young people young people who I'm defining as extends into uh, the early 20s. But I also just want to note that it's not just special protections that youth need. It's also opportunities for them to build the very skills that are necessary for being a healthy, independent adult and a contributing member of society. So let me just begin by providing some general background on the developing brain. And I want to preface this by saying uh, the brain has the capacity for change, what we sometimes refer to as plasticity, throughout the entire life course. We see significant changes, particularly during the first two decades that are illustrated here in gray matter and white matter volume. And let me just unpack this for you. Um, you may not know that in early development, we have more cells and connections and synapses um, than we ever will have going forward. Uh, and that includes in the adult brain. So basically this gray matter represents those brain cell bodies and how they're being sculpted with age and experience. And we also see with age and experience that fibers or axons that connect the remaining brain cells are strengthened with what we refer to this fatty white tissue uh, or myelin that increases the speed of neural connections. And so you see dramatic changes in these first two decades that continues, there's a stabilization, and then we see a decrease with age. Now, if we just look at images of the cortex, here you can see from the ages from childhood to um, the early 20s, the areas that are turning blue are areas that are reaching peak cortical thickness. And if I show you a static image, and this is looking down on top of the brain, this is the motor cortex and sensory cortex. We see these regions reaching adult cortical thickness that are involved in seeing, hearing, um, seeing and moving before we see development of areas of the prefrontal cortex that are very important in regulating our movements, our actions, our emotions, and our desires. But it's not just changes that are happening in the prefrontal cortex. We also know that there are structural changes in deep primitive regions of the brain. Um, these are involved in desire, rage, and fight and flight. And so, we see subtle changes that are actually occurring in these regions before those in the prefrontal cortex shown here in fuchsia. So these data 
um, together with data from functional imaging studies as well as structural, suggest that there's an imbalance in the development of the adolescent brain with primitive limbic circuits shown in red and uh, that are involved in desire, fear, and rage, and those involved in regulation of these emotions and rational thought shown in green are developing at different time points. So in emotionally charged situations, those limbic circuits tend to win out. So it's the case that if we turn and look at behavioral changes during adolescence, they map on um, and parallel the changes that I've just described to you in the adolescent brain. So first, it's the case that we see a heightened sensitivity to emotional information related to rewards, threat, stress, um, also social information like peer influences, and this is combined with this underappreciation of risk and consequences. Self-regulation and decision-making under these emotionally arousing conditions actually show steady improvements and they extend into the 20s. And these parallel those same changes that I was previously talking about in the prefrontal cortex and in related circuitry. So I just wanna provide sort of a, an overview slide in terms of how this has been examined by Steinberg and others with data from around the world. This includes both self-report measures as well as laboratory task um, measures to assess sensation seeking, which shown here to peak in the late teen years and also self-regulation, which is stabilizing by the mid 20s. So throughout this presentation, what I'd like to do is unpack what I mean by sensation seeking, um, evidence that comes from both brain and behavioral studies, and also how that can um, interact and uh, show changes in our ability to regulate ourselves. So a first aspect that's associated with sensation seeking um, that relates to rewards and also the influence of peers um, is first the sensitivity to rewards. So money has a big impact on us. Money has a really big impact on adolescence. And there have been numerous, probably one of the most replicated findings is that adolescents show a heightened sensitivity to rewards when they win versus lose money, like in a gambling task, and reward-related circuitry, specifically here in the ventral striatum, a deep structure in the brain. Now, this is just simply in receipt to reward, but a big question is, how do these sensitivities relate to our own regulation of self or cognitive capacity? So, Another aspect of sensation seeking is our response to peers. So, um, or a heightened sensitivity to social cues, particularly positive social cues. So we can examine our sensitivity to this type of information by superimposing pictures like this into a cognitive task. And this is an impulse control task, or some of you may have heard of or familiar with a go no go task. And so basically in the task, the majority of the time when you see a particular face, you're going. So you're almost building up this habitual tendency to respond. And then there's this rare stimulus that appears and it's the type of stimulus you've been told don't respond to. And so if we look at performance on this task where you have to override and inhibit actions, we see that children make more of these areas. They go when they've been told not to go. So they're more impulsive than adolescents who are more impulsive than adults. But what's really interesting, if you look at the type of mistakes that the adolescents are making on this task, you see that they're far more sensitive to these positive social cues than they are the neutral ones. So if you look at the difference in the number of errors they make and impulsive responses to these social cues, these two different types of social cues, what you see is that teens, unlike children or adults, make more impulsive errors to those positive social cues than they do the neutral ones. And if we then look at the brain to see what the neural correlates are of this behavioral performance, what we see is that same region I just told you about, in response to receiving a reward, the same area shows enhanced activation in adolescence 
And again, this is a pattern that we don't see in children and adults. Now, these are just social cues. And if we really want to understand the influence of peers, it's important for them to be present when we're engaging in these experiments. So I want to tell you another one about a decision-making task where the manipulation is performing the task alone or performing it when peers are watching. And this is, this is a game that we have all played in real life. It is, do you or don't you go through the yellow light? And you all know when you've done this um, and when you um, choose to go through it and take risky um, chances. And so again, the primary manipulation is to look at performance when the adolescent and the adult is performing this task alone or when they're with a peer. And then we measure the number of risky decisions when they went through the yellow light, when they probably shouldn't have, and also when they go through the yellow light and that results in a crash. So I now wanna show you those data. And before I even show them to you, I want you to focus on the blue bars. The blue bars are performance when the individual was alone and what we're plotting are the not percentage of risky decisions and the number of crashes. This is important to note that decisions in adolescence can be comparable to adults when you don't have these socially and emotionally charged situations. However, the minute you put a peer in the room, what we see is a significant increase in these risky decisions and also in the number of crashes. And again, if we look at neural correlates that are associated with these risky decisions that is going through the yellow light when a peer is present, Again, we see the same area in the ventral striatum, part of reward um, circuitry that is activated. And I just have to show this because I think it's important. Many times we talk about how Western civilization has created this uh, period of adolescence, but we even see this peer influence in other species. So sure enough, mice, when they're with cage mates, as opposed to when they're alone, drink more um, uh, than um, what we see in adults. So in adults, you don't see any difference between when they're without a, a cage mate or when they're um, with another cage mate. But with the juvenile mice, we actually see that they spend more time next to that nozzle uh, where they can get the ethanol, um, which is consistent with increased drinking in humans uh, in peer situations. So I've been focusing largely on uh, cognitive abilities that are impacted by sort of a, a whole group of um, constructs related to sensation seeking. But it's often the case that when young people come into contact with the law, um, it's under stressful and threatening conditions. So I want to examine the impact of stress and threat on our cognitive capacity and how that changes with development. Let me just say that we know um, stress is this type of change that causes physical, emotional, and psychological strain. And we know from a large literature that there's an optimal amount of stress um, that is associated with uh, optimal performance. And if you have too little, that can be associated with boredom. But if you have too much, that can actually import, impact your performance dramatically. And we know from elegant animal work that when we're in high stress conditions, neurochemicals or neurotransmitters in the brain um, increase to levels that can actually impact uh, different brain regions. So in particular, the prefrontal cortex, this work is suggested in these high stress conditions, it's almost like taking the prefrontal cortex offline. Um, and at the same time, some of these emotional centers that I've been talking about in these circuits see elevated activation. So when I mentioned that imbalance model under stress, you see that even more exaggerated than what you would typically um, during adolescence. So first, let's just look at the effects of stress. And these are self-reported stress where um, individuals are letting the experimenters know if uh, a day is a high level of stress or if it's a day where the stress levels are relatively low. And then um, what the scientists did is they brought in the use on days when there was high stress or low stress, and they looked at their performance on a go-no-go -go task to look at impulsivity. And then they also looked at their brain 
during performance of that task in both those conditions. And what you can see in this graph in gray are the adolescents and they show more false alarms. So the higher the bar, the more errors that they're making um, where they're in a high stress state. And that's a pattern that we aren't seeing in the adults. And when we look at the neural correlates of this behavior, what we see is that the very area, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that's been associated with performance on this task is decreased in activity in these adolescents during high stress, which is consistent with a description that a number of um, my uh, neuroscientist colleagues who work with animals have suggested with regard to neurochemicals that increase in the brain um, that almost like takes the prefrontal cortex offline. But what about threat? So there are a number of ways in which we can assess uh, conditions of threat and see how well we can perform a task. But um, let me just give you two examples in the interest of time. One is we can use cues where I don't think that this picture is scaring you, but over a lifetime we've learned when we see this expression, there's some uncertainty about um, threat, its location and what it is. There's also a condition that's more sustained uncertain threat. And this is a terrible thing that we've done to our participants. First, we bring them in and we ask them to do this impulse control task. We include these cues that I showed you before. And then the other condition to look at sustained threat is to tell them that when the computer screen, the background goes a certain color, we don't know if or when, but they could hear this loud, aversive sound. Um, and the participants rate it as aversive. They hear it before they begin the task and they describe it as aversive as that loud alarm clock early in the morning, or the accidental scraping of a fingernail on a chalkboard. So what I want to do is plot the performance on the same go-no-go no go task. We're now looking at cognitive control. This is like accuracy. It includes accuracy and how well you detect the target and how well you stop yourself when there's a rare non-target. And what you see in these two conditions of threat is that 18 to 21 year olds, just like younger teens, have significantly worse performance in these conditions than adults over 21. What we also see when we look at the brain to see neural correlates during these conditions while they're performing the task is that just like in the previous stress condition that I talked about, um, under threat, those individuals under 21 are not activating an area of the prefrontal cortex, the lateral prefrontal cortex, as much as those individuals over 21 who are actually performing better. In fact, the areas that these younger age groups are activating are areas in medial limbic cortex, suggesting emotional activation of emotional processing centers, um, and they're performing worse on this task. And you should note that those individuals who are over 21 um, are activating those emotional uh, regions and circuits less. So the changes in the brain and behavior that I've shown you during the extended period of adolescence shows a similar developmental pattern as what we see in the peak of the age crime curve from mid-adolescence to the early 20s. And since we're talking about the age crime curve, I think it's very important for us to not just focus on typical development, which these samples, the majority of them have been typically developing individuals, but rather to look at the development with regard to extreme behaviors. And so by extreme behaviors, we'll focus on psychopathic traits. We know in the United States that psychopathy is relatively rare. The estimates are at 1% in this country. Um, but what if we look at individuals who have psychopathic traits, does that change across development? So this is a study I want to report the findings from over a thousand justice involved youth who showed actually from 16 to 24 years of age, a decrease in their psychopathic traits. And this is consistent with other studies and findings <clears throat> suggesting that the majority of youth who commit crimes desist as they uh, mature into adulthood. 
What's important to note is that these extreme behaviors decline even more when youth receive targeted interventions. So let me just show you an example. So here <clears throat> we have individuals who have high levels of antisocial behavior and low levels. And when they receive a youth targeted intervention, we're seeing equal effectiveness in that treatment on the mean number of violent offenses. So often when we transfer youth to adult courts, those individuals we think of as incorrigible or um, we really can't change their behavior. But basically what these data are suggesting that youth are not treatment resistant or even less responsive to treatment. It's about getting the right treatment. I just want to present one more bit of um, data that I think is relevant for this conversation in terms of thinking about individuals as encourageable or um, less likely to change. And that's in looking at um, personality and who we are. Um, there's a common belief that our personality develops very early and that then that remains stable throughout the life course. But it's actually the case if you look at different aspects of personality that not only does it develop throughout childhood and adolescence, but you're seeing it changing later. And I'm just highlighting two because they're really relevant to the notion of self-regulation that I've been describing throughout this presentation. And you're seeing that they show drastic changes after 18 years of age that continue throughout the lifespan. So just to briefly summarize, I hope what I've demonstrated is that we have evidence that shows continued changes in brain and behavior over the life course, but especially during this period of adolescence. The science shows that the majority of youth who engage in antisocial behavior show declines in that criminal behavior with age and with targeted interventions, we can get an even bigger decline. And also, the evidence shows that there are changes in personality over the lifespan. Um, so who we are as a child or an adolescent is continuing to change um, as we continue to develop. And so assigning adult status to children is not based on biology or psychology, and it's not supported by any of the evidence that I presented today. Our youth deserve protections, and they also deserve opportunities so that they can build the very skills they need for becoming contributing members of society. Thank you so much, BJ, for giving us an overview of adolescent brain development, risk-taking, and the influence of stress and threat appraisal on decision-making, um, and also speaking to criminal trajectories and the stability of personality and psychopathic traits over time and resilience. You covered a lot in 20 minutes. Um, now I will turn things over to Marsha Levick, who will get us all up to speed on the status of youth sentencing laws and then we will have what I think will be a robust discussion of whether the science and the law are aligned or whether there is a disconnect. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and I wanna also just thank um, Petrie Fahm and MGH CLBB for bringing BJ and me together uh, today. It's always great to present with BJ um, and appreciate the opportunity to have this important conversation. And um, I think the sort of preliminary point that I want to make, and I'm going to be relying on BJ to move my slides for me, thank you, um, is even before talking about this slide, is that I hope what you took from BJ's remarks is that the science is incredibly um, kind of uncontroverted and compelling and convincing that there are certain things we know about both the development of adolescents and young adults, emerging adults, that consistently demonstrates that they are indeed different from adults. But what you will hear from my remarks is that the law absolutely uh, is not catching up with what the science said. So if we can look at the first slide of the map, um, I'm gonna talk a bit more in detail about what you're seeing on this map. What I really wanted to just illustrate for you here is literally the patchwork. And when we talk about transfer laws, and I'm gonna define what transfer means, but essentially the conversation today is about um, treating children as adults, trying them, prosecuting them, 
sentencing them in the adult criminal justice system. Um, we do not have a uniform approach to this across the country. We have different approaches that are reflected in the fact that the United States is rare in the sense that rather than having a national system of juvenile justice, we have 51 different jurisdictions. We have 50 states in the District of Columbia, all of whom um, have the, uh, the legal authority under our federalist system to design their own juvenile justice systems constrained only by relatively minimal uh, limitations that the U.S. Constitution imposes upon them. A little bit of federal law coming out of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act and of course some state constitutional um, provisions that may likewise restrain uh, what states can do when treating children. Um, but so this is what it looks like when we think about how we treat children across the U.S. and under what circumstances they may be eligible for prosecution and sentencing in the adult system. It's a patchwork. Um, so let's move to the next slide. The most important thing for me to do, I think, is just to share with you the definitions of uh, transfer. There are multiple definitions that states use across the country. And the other caveat that I want to share with you is that these are largely uh, dynamic issues. Just as the science is evolving and educating us about the qualities and traits of adolescents and young adults, legislatures are trying to keep up. Um, but it is impossible for us, frankly, to, I can't give you a and April 4th, 2023, absolutely certain the breakdown of which states do what, um, because we are always a couple of years behind in data. So when I share this with you, um, I would say give or take a state in every one of these categories as the law continues to evolve and try to be responsive to changing events, sometimes political events and sometimes scientific events. Um, judicial waiver, uh, 47 states in the District of Columbia all utilize judicial waiver. And that simply means, as it sounds, that this is where a uh, petition is presented to a juvenile court judge asking the juvenile court judge to exercise their discretion in determining whether or not um, a particular child before that judge is eligible for transfer, should be transferred and prosecuted in the adult criminal justice system, or whether they should be retained in juvenile court. And I want to make another point here. BJ's slides, I thought, were really powerful in recognizing that um, the availability of treatment and the access to treatment has real consequences for the changing behaviors that we are able to chart among adolescents um, in terms of the age crime curve. But unfortunately, the test in juvenile court, um, generally across the board for whether or not children should be tried as adults, is this concept of amenability to treatment in the juvenile justice system. And what often happens is that judges will make determinations that they don't think there's enough time in juvenile court to allow for available treatment options to actually have an impact. It's also often the case that there may simply not be a facility available in a particular jurisdiction. And the absence of available facilities will also uh, lead a particular juvenile court judge to say, I don't see where I can expose you, where I can provide treatment. Um, so I don't think that I can demonstrate that you're amenable to treatment. The tragedy about that aspect of how we think about transferring children to the adult criminal justice system is that despite the evidence that BJ shared about the relevance and the impact of treatment, once these youth are put into the adult criminal justice system, those systems are driven by punishment and retribution. They are not at all centered on rehabilitation, the kinds of programs rehabilitation programs and positive interventions that will be available in the adult system for kids uh, will be significantly fewer uh, if they exist at all than what you will see in the juvenile system. So we've created this kind of false um, query where we are looking for the ability to treat children in the juvenile system without recognizing um, that if you transfer them into the adult system, you will actually completely lose the opportunity to really have an impact um, on their behaviors and on their antisocial behaviors, as BJ mentioned. 
Statutory exclusion is also utilized um, by the majority of states in the District of Columbia. Statutory exclusion uh, doesn't involve the court at all. It is really a situation where uh, the legislature is going to carve out specific categories of crimes, often tying the crime itself to the age of the young offender, um, and to simply pull those crimes and individuals, those children, out of juvenile court jurisdiction. They can do that because under U.S. constitutional law, uh, there is no right to be tried in juvenile court. While we've had a series of U.S. Supreme Court cases over the last 15 years that have certainly circumscribed the ways in which we can punish children in the adult criminal justice system, we have never yet had a decision of the U.S. Supreme Court that has said it is simply unconstitutional to treat children identically to adults to allow them to be prosecuted at all in the criminal justice system. So that means that state legislatures are free to carve up juvenile court jurisdiction, to put certain things into juvenile court jurisdiction and pull things out. There are a number of states across the country, for example, that exclude homicide from juvenile court jurisdiction. Many states do that by a kind of homicide and age uh, duality so that uh, children who are charged with homicide who are older than 14 may automatically be tried in the adult system or at the age of 12, or as you'll see uh, in a subsequent slide, it may be that there are no lower age jurisdictions. So the continuous effort to define the boundaries of juvenile court, who's in and who's out, which is entirely permissible under our constitutional scheme, also allows for states to simply exclude certain children from juvenile court jurisdiction and pushes them into the adult criminal justice system. Direct file, mandatory waiver, mind over, decline. There are a lot of different terms that states use across the country. Um, you can see that number is at around 11 states. So a majority of states do this. What direct file means um, is that the uh, the legislature has determined that particular kinds of crimes, again, often tied as well to the age of the particular child at the time the crime is committed, will automatically start in uh, criminal court, but it may be that there will be uh, the opportunity to bring that case back to juvenile court, depending upon whether or not um, the state provides for reverse waiver, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but this is a kind of presumptive waiver and assumption that uh, children who are charged with specific crimes belong in criminal court, and that's where those cases will begin. There are also um, right now approximately 14 states, a minority of states again, that also allow for something um, that I always tend to think of as prosecutorial discretion. We can also call it concurrent jurisdiction. And what that means is that um, prosecutors get to make the decision themselves on their own. A prosecutor can decide whether or not to charge a particular child who is charged with a particular crime, whether to charge that in adult court or to charge it in juvenile court. One of the really concerning aspects of prosecutorial discretion is that this is often unreviewable. So that prosecutors in states that allow for this kind of um, charging discretion, this ability to try kids as adults that is driven by prosecutor choice, pretty much gives these prosecutors unfettered discretion to make that determination. We also have something called once an adult, always an adult. Um, again, a significant number of states, but a minority of states. And what that means is that if, for example, a child has been transferred into the adult criminal justice system, they have been sentenced and are uh, serving time in an adult correctional facility. They're under the age of 18. Once while in that adult facility, perhaps they assault someone, perhaps they run away, um, commit something that is considered to be a crime in that jurisdiction. Even though they're under 18, they will automatically be treated as an adult um, because they have already been transferred into the adult criminal justice system. And then finally, we have something called reverse waiver. Um, as you can see, a majority of states do provide for that. Reverse waiver often follows direct file and mandatory waiver or presumptive waiver. And what reverse waiver does is it, it actually gives the criminal court judge the opportunity and the authority to transfer a case back to juvenile court. 
So in other words, if, for example, I'll use an example from my home state of Pennsylvania, if a child is charged with homicide in Pennsylvania, uh, they will automatically be charged as an adult, and that case will start out in criminal court. However, that child's lawyer can petition the criminal court judge to send that case back to juvenile court. The burden will be on the uh, criminal defense lawyer to prove that the transfer meets the requirements under the state law to uh, make that child eligible for being treated in juvenile court. It will include this question of amenability to treatment. It will look at issues of the particular crime, the child's involvement, um, the public interest and public safety considerations. And I think one of the interesting things about reverse waiver is that in states that have reverse waiver, we often see that when it is invoked and when in fact the child's lawyer petitions the criminal court judge to send that case back to juvenile court. In the majority of cases, these cases actually do come back to juvenile court, which of course raises an interesting question about why these cases are being sent into criminal court at all in the first instance. Okay, next slide. So I wanted to share this with you because I think when we talk about transfer, although we're specifically talking about who's in and who's out of juvenile court, um, I think it's also important to appreciate that this is really an issue of boundaries and uh, what are the boundaries of juvenile court in any particular jurisdiction. This is very much related to transfer, not always the same thing, um, particularly at the upper levels, but I think it's important to, to just sort of see these numbers in the context of a conversation about transfer of kids into the adult system. So 27 states specify no lower age for juvenile court jurisdiction. I want to add a caveat here um, because I can give you, for example, I want to talk about Pennsylvania, which is listed here um, as being a state that doesn't provide for that. Um, and Pennsylvania, um, it's well, it's it's not listed there. But what I what I meant by that is that it it essentially um, some states will provide for no lower age of juvenile court jurisdiction for a particular set of crimes. In, other, in, in other instances, they will have a different age of jurisdiction. So that non-specified number um, can be a little bit confusing. Um, you see that the age of six, we have one state of North Carolina, Connecticut and New York, the age of seven, Washington state, the age of eight, um, a number of states, the age of 10. And again, Pennsylvania shows up there and yet we have no lower age of juvenile court jurisdiction um, for homicide. Um, one state at 11 um, and then three states at 12, California, Massachusetts, and Utah. This is incredibly important if you just sort of take a moment and think about the science that you just heard, um, the, the presentation from BJ. Um, what in the world are we doing holding six, seven, eight, even 10 and 11 year olds, um, even remotely responsible for criminal activity, even though it is in juvenile court, uh, we tend to apply the same considerations, the same legal considerations in terms of mens rea, criminal intent. Um, and yet we have all of this information that clearly demonstrates not just what we know about the adolescent brain, but even before then, um, the very, uh, you know, delayed and ongoing development of critical critical areas of the brain. Um, and yet you see a number of states across the country that really bring very young children into the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. Next slide. And so here, um, this is the minimum transfer age that is specified by statute. Again, you see this very significant number of states have non-specified. In many of these, that non-specified non may only be related to a very specific crime. It may be homicide. Um, we see that in a number of states across the country. Uh, but you will also see um, within a state, again, Pennsylvania is an example, where you may have no minimum transfer age specified for homicide, um, we will have a minimum transfer age of 14 or 15 for other specific felonies in the state of Pennsylvania. That is not uncommon across other jurisdictions. What's really, what I really wanna highlight here um, is to actually look at the very bottom state, which is California. California passed legislation a few years ago, um, really the most progressive transfer legislation in the country in which they set the age um, at which any child in California can be transferred for prosecution into the adult criminal justice system at 16. 
and that's um, the obviously the highest age across the country um, hasn't quite started a trend. We're not seeing that happen in other jurisdictions right now, uh, but I did want to flag that for you. The other point that I would make here is that we still have um, three states, Texas, Georgia, and Wisconsin, that still treat 17-year-olds as adults. So again, despite all of the research uh, that has been available to legislators and policymakers for the last uh, couple of decades at this point about the uh, continuing developmental uh, capacities of adolescents and teenagers, we are we have three states across the country that treat all 17 year olds no matter what crime they are charged with from misdemeanor to felony uh in the adult system there's been a number of efforts in the legislatures in those states to amend those laws but so far they have been resistant uh next slide so um here i wanted to just kind of touch on um trends that we are seeing in terms of how states are absorbing and responding to uh, the science. And I think this is really all about states very specifically responding to the scientific, scientific information that has been made available by GBJ and her many colleagues. Um, so Vermont um, is kind of leading the charge here, raising the upper age of juvenile court jurisdiction to 19. That means that anyone um, who is uh, 18 or younger, uh, will be in now in the juvenile court in Vermont, and they will be raising that age over the next couple of years, um, not just to 19, but also to 20. Um, that is directly responsive to the legislation, uh, I'm sorry, to the uh, research that BJ shared. Um, but again, we're not seeing um, any other states quite ready to follow suit. There was some legislation introduced in Connecticut a few years ago um, that so far has not been passed. In terms of raising the minimum age for criminal prosecution, again, I mentioned uh, California, which raised the age a few years ago to 16. Um, in terms of specific transfer law provisions, Missouri, for example, um, has made, uh, has kind of changed the way that they, the, the procedures that are available um, for transferring children in Missouri between the ages of 12 and 18. Um, it may be uh, relevant and uh, pursuant only to a judicial hearing that's discretionary, but if youth under 12 are charged, they have to have um, a, ju a judicial hearing to determine whether or not um, transfer is possible. We're also seeing some developments in terms of where children who have been transferred, where they're being detained while they are awaiting trial. So Utah, for example, uh, any youth who has been transferred into the criminal justice system uh, not only must be held um, in a pretrial facility while they're awaiting trial, a juvenile facility um, up until age 21, but even if they are convicted as an adult in criminal court, they also have to be held in a juvenile facility until age until the age of 21. Um, also some developments in terms of the age under, at which kids can be committed to juvenile correctional facilities in Mississippi, for example, not necessarily a state that we think of as especially progressive. Children under the age of 12 can't be committed to a state training school um, and youth must be adjudicated for a felony for state training school commitment at any age. Um, also requiring that states make specific findings about the least restrictive alternative, reasonable proximity to family, sorry, that's a typo, um, and whether or not the facilities can provide rehabilitative services. So, um, you know, my conclusion <laughs> is that um, the science is out there, the science is compelling, um, but the states have been very slow to catch up uh, in every way in which we think about the boundaries of juvenile court, specifically for the purposes of this discussion with respect to trying children in criminal court, um, states do their own thing. And I think we could, we will continue to see this kind of patchwork of responses, uh, I think, for the foreseeable future. So I will stop there so that we can hopefully get some engagement with the audience. Thank you, Marsha. That was great. And thank you for uh, giving us the legal landscape. And I see a few questions from the audience. Please feel free to put more questions in the Q&A. Um, I have a first question. So Marsha, I'm curious uh, as to whether courts and state legislatures have been receptive to the science. 
um, and the developments in the science, like the research that BJ highlighted. And I'm also curious, what are the legal foundations for arguments against these state transfer laws? Are we looking at the Eighth Amendment, just proportionality, state constitutional arguments, something else? Um, both great questions. Um, so in, in answer to your first one, um, legislatures are not terribly responsive to the uh, the research that BJ shared regarding emerging adults. Uh, you know, they, they get um, the research regarding children under the age of 18. I My own view is that the juvenile court was created 123 years ago in Cook County in Illinois. It was based upon an intuitive understanding that kids are different, that children are different from adults. And I believe that what the science handed those state legislatures was a scientific vocabulary for what they intuitively understood. When you talk about over 18, that's not working for them. Um, they, they are much more inclined to think of kids over 18, the age of majority in many states for many things, not everything, as BJ mentioned, if you think about the ability to um, simply buy tobacco, buy cigarettes, buy alcohol, um, certain driving restrictions, the ability to serve on juries. Um, there are all kinds of ways. That, and the fact that kids are remain now on their ins parents' insurance until age 26, extended foster care through age 23. Um, there are so many ways in which we do recognize the limitations, the developmental, the maturity limitations of individuals over the age of 18. But when it comes to criminality, when it comes to our justice system, policymakers are very resistant. And so to sort of lead that into your second question, why? Um, I think that the reason they're resistant is that the U.S. justice system is a retributive system. It is really steeped in punishment and founded on a principle of punishment. The juvenile court is an exception to that. The juvenile court is over here, um, sort of throwing in this idea of rehabilitation and treatment, but it is not the natural way that we think about how we respond to criminal behavior. And so to, to take the science that BJ shared and use that as a way of extending the benefits of a rehabilitative system uh, really is a, is a cultural quagmire, I would say, for America. Um, it is a concept that is very difficult for us to appreciate because we just assume um, that the natural response to criminal offending is a punitive one. And in terms of the legal arguments, so it's definitely not the Eighth Amendment. The reason why it's not the, not the Eighth Amendment, which is a very kind of legalistic response that I'm going to give, but I'll try to make it um, very clear, is that the Eighth Amendment is really about challenging forms of punishment. And the issue about where children are tried, whether they are prosecuted in the adult system or the juvenile system, is really one of jurisdiction. It's one of the boundaries of our, our in or out of juvenile court, in or out of criminal court. And the only tool that we have to challenge those decisions and the many statutory provisions that are out there across the country is actually to utilize something called due process, substantive due process, to really argue that the, the particular pathway that a legislature has chosen to try children as adults offends our notions of what is fair, um, what is acceptable behavior, what is an acceptable way to treat individuals under the age of age of 18 in this country. Um, and so we utilize a due process set of arguments, which are not often not as powerful as Eighth Amendment arguments, where there again is a kind of intuitive sense, now fed by science, mm -hmm. about what is right or wrong. It's a little bit murkier in the field of due process. And so it's actually very difficult to challenge any given state's pathway to trying kids as adults. That is very interesting. Um, BJ, I wanna to turn to you. Uh, you presented a, sort of a, a nice uh, landscape of the neuroscience and the behavioral research. And um, I would imagine that the research that you shared is based on group data. Um, we often call this uh, the group to individual, the G to I problem. Um, and I'm just wondering on an individual basis, if we have, say, a 15-year-old or 16-year-old who's charged with a violent crime, uh, can we predict if they're going to go on to offend when they're in adulthood? Is that something that science can help us do, or is that something that, that's really difficult to do given the, the science? I think I have two responses to that. First, you know, the science isn't at a point that we can infer from group to individual, um, and I and I think that's a very in, important point to make. But 
I also just want to highlight, and often I'll show this slide, and that is, given that the evidence I presented was based on um, group data, when you look at, say, a group of 16 or 17 year olds, and you look at all that individual variability, there's more variability in that group um, than there is or equivalent to the variability that you see between two age groups. And so I want to highlight that. I think that's important. But I also hope that the data that I presented in terms of the natural decline in criminal behavior, we know it from the age curve rate in terms of the peak and the subsequent decline, but also the power of getting the right intervention or treatment and how that impacts young people. Even if they're showing high antisocial behavior, it impacts their criminal behavior. I think it's powerful and suggests that even as scientists, it, we would be hard pressed to predict an individual engaging in subject, uh, you know, subsequent crime. Um, and I think when we do make those decisions, there is a lot of room for subjectivity and also bias. And I didn't have time today to talk about bias, but when it comes to how we treat um, youth of color in our legal system, um, we know from studies by Phil Goff that police officers perceive um, black youth who are suspects for felonies as almost four years older than they are, as more guilty, and they also use more force. And, um, and so the subjectivity is a real problem when we're trying to predict you know, who is going to um, engage again and the treatment of that individual based on our own sub subjective uh, impressions and biases. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, and we have more questions in the chat. Uh, there's a question of, did the SJC decide a recent case about youth under 21? So I think you're talking about Commonwealth v. Mattis that'll be decided next month is my understanding. Um, and there are questions about um, ways to present the science in court that are more compelling. Uh, Marsha, I would imagine that you've become sort of a very good translator of the science uh, and uh, BJU as well in terms of um, making the science more accessible to lay people. Um, sometimes in our field, we can talk using a lot of jargon and people don't understand what we're saying. Um, Marsha, have you uh, sort of run into strategies that have been more successful in terms of articulating the science of adolescence? So I would say, yeah, we rely on experts like BJ. <laughs> 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 That's what we do. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that is the truth. So let me answer the question slightly differently. I don't think there's magic to it. The science is the science. Um, what I think that the, the challenge that I think we face as we continue to try to push the envelope, um, to push the age boundaries and how courts respond to young people who violate the criminal law um, is really, I think, uh, the reluctance of courts sometimes uh, to think that it's within their jurisdiction to make those kinds of very dramatic changes. Um, and I think the concern is that when courts are presented, even with the scientific research that makes a very compelling case for why we should treat this individual who may be 19, the same as we treat someone who is 17, um, there is a hesitation. Is this my job or is it for the legislature to do that? To the extent that we are redefining jurisdictional boundaries of juvenile court, um, I worry there's a hesitancy to defer to the legislature. That hasn't happened as much on the sentencing front, which I want to acknowledge that obviously we had enormous success um, over the last 20 years in really challenging sentencing practices. But sentencing is something that judges inherently do. That is what they do. Um, they do it within the boundaries set by the legislature, but they have an enormous amount of discretion to do that. Legislatures like to think that they de they define who goes where. Um, and so I think that's the tension that we're seeing in some jurisdictions in some of these cases right now, which is who's going to make the choice. Okay. And we have about a minute left. So if you could each take 20 to 30 seconds and just say what you think is the most important takeaway here that uh, maybe people don't understand or attend to um, in terms of youth sentencing in, in adult criminal court. BJ, why don't we start with you? Well, I mean, I hope it's obvious. Um, the most important part is, you know, healthy development is a human right 
And um, the way that we are treating young people in this country is not providing them with that basic right. Um, in some cases, though, you know, we try to protect them by the drinking age. And in other cases, we'll transfer someone as young as um, six. Um, so we have, a, we have a long way to go, but we really need to move in the direction of remediation as opposed to being punitive. And that is going to be, as Marcia said, a real paradigm shift in this country. A lot of countries, um, it's working really well. Thank you, BJ. And Marcia, final thoughts and answers to that question? I, yeah, I mean, to follow up on what BJ said, I think that we tolerate an inconsistency in how we approach young people um, who are involved with the justice system in this country that is irrational. Uh, it is completely counter to scientific knowledge that we possess and have reasonable access to. And I think the unwillingness to follow the science combined with a cultural commitment to punishment has really prevented us from making smart choices. Thank you, Marcia. I think that's a great place to end. Um, thank you both for presenting today. I know I learned a lot um, and thank you all for attending. Thank, thank you. you.